So, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Emergential Structure Series. Uh, I'm very delighted to be introducing our, uh, our speaker today, Dr. Shahir Abdulani, uh, uh, who actually happens to be wearing many hats. She's a clinician, an entrepreneur, and a medical device innovation and commercialization professional. And will be telling us today about uh, uh, the reimbursement uh, uh, environment in Canada for medical devices. Uh, I'd also like to extend my thanks to Shahira as she had a last, uh, uh, last minute change of plans and was in the US actually this morning and was generous enough to come here and uh, uh, deliver the lecture uh, for us this evening. Thank you so much, Shahira. Um, so a little bit of uh, background on Shahira. Uh, Shahira is the director of Amaris Excite and she's also VP Business Development and Operations for Excite International. She also serves in the advisory capacity to medical device innovators within the Mars portfolio and provides strategic support to these ventures in their commercialization endeavors. Before this, she was the VP of the Health, uh, uh, sorry, Innovation Services at the Health Technology Exchange. And uh, she, in this position, she focused on providing funding opportunities and support services and thought leadership to the interior medical device sector and health system at large. With a keen interest in innovation procurement, as well as medical device re reimbursement, obviously, in local and international contexts, Shahira has developed niche expertise and an extensive network of local and international partners in these areas. As a seasoned entrepreneur and clinician, Shahira brings a unique patient and a clinical perspective, as well as sound business acumen in medical device development. Shahira holds a Bachelor of Science in Physical uh, Therapy from the University of Western Ontario and a Master's in International Health Technology Assessment and Management from the University of Montreal. Uh, once again, thank you so much, Shahira, for being our guest here tonight. Pleasure. Yep. Thanks. And uh, hello, everybody. I'm amazed that there are people that actually showed up at seven o'clock <laughs> on, uh, on a Thursday night. So thank you for being here. Uh, I'm actually looking forward to sharing a little bit about the the journey of reimbursement and the, the considerations that you'd want to think through. Now, I was just getting a really quick synopsis of who's in the room, just so I could, you know, potentially contextualize the the, the information. To make it most relevant to yourself. So my understanding is many of you are in the process of ideating, creating, and thinking through commercialization of a particular solution to help fix a, so a problem that you've identified within the system here. Um, and that's super. I mean, I think there is, the, the one thing that I totally support is the idea of saying, you know, you've got to pull technology model when you're looking at the system to say, what can I fix? You're going to have a whole lot more of an easier time managing all of the hurdles and hoops that you'd have to get through to actually get paid for your technology from the day. So you're on the right track. I think this is a super program in terms of what it's accomplishing and what it's trying to do. So without further ado, we will go through our material. So so that you know, the material that I've put together here, oftentimes I've done workshops on it, and these workshops last about four hours. And so what I'm doing in 45 minutes is really, really skimming the surface. And for you to just start to understand some of the concepts that are important to think about, uh, for you to then start to use your own initiatives and time and resources to really dig deep into some of these topics that we're gonna to cover today, because you will need to understand it in a whole lot more depth than what we will be covering this evening. Uh, so a little bit about what we're gonna do. We'll talk, of, we'll talk an overview of, of the Canadian reimbursement and HTA landscape. If you don't know what HTA is, we'll talk about that. Uh, and that's important because if you're thinking about Sunnybrook as, you know, potentially your first customer uh, for the techs that you're looking to innovate within, uh, you want to understand how it is that you're going to create your business case for them at the end of the day to buy your technology and pay you for it. Uh, we will talk about some the one-on-ones on a few very relevant topics when you think through reimbursement. Uh, and then the way that I think it'll help you put it all together is we'll walk through a case example of a technology that was trying to come into Canada and you know what happened to it, how it managed its way through, and we'll talk through you know whether it was successful or not and what that looked like relative to the rest of the world. So you have a better sense of you know um, what what are some of the challenges. And oftentimes as you in courses talk about the regulatory regime or the reimbursement landscape. You know, it's understanding it as one thing, but then working with it, uh, with it is a very, very different thing. Um, whatever they, what, whatever you sort of get online, and you know what the to dos talk to you about in terms of what you should expect, 
oftentimes it's not the case. And so let's just kind of walk through this case example to give you a little bit more of a flavor for what it is uh, that you would potentially experience. So quickly around the, the Canadian health tech sector or the healthcare sector, um, you must know a lot of this, so I'll skim through a lot of this and get right to the meat. So we've got about 35 million people, um, $211 billion of a healthcare spend in 2013, and that's about 11.2% of GDP. We are a system that's a mix of public and private dollars. And so about 70% of healthcare costs are publicly funded through taxpayer dollars. Uh, and the remaining 30% are paid for either privately or out of pocket uh, by yourself as a patient. Um, publicly funded healthcare costs are paid through Medicare. And that's Canada's national health insurance program. And Medicare is a single payer system. Uh, in which medically necessary hospital and physician services are provided with fees paid for by the government. And so these are federally, uh, these are federal dollars oftentimes that come, you know, down through to the prov provincial level that sort of get mixed in with provincial taxes to be able to then cover costs of medical care. The administration of health care, although a lot of the dollars are coming from the federal um, land, um, the administration of this actually is a responsibility of provincial and territorial governments. So you're already starting to get a sense of a bit of the fractured nature of our healthcare system. And it's a bit of a misnomer because, you know, we he you'll hear it oftentimes, we're a single payer system. If you think about Ontario, we're a single payer system that's a $52 billion healthcare industry. That's a massive number. And if you talk to the rest of the world, they think that's pretty phenomenal to have one payer being responsible for that much of a spend. Um, but when we think about how the actual spend occurs, that's another story. So we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Um, okay, so the hospital, physician services and drugs are the, the largest categories of healthcare expenditures in Canada. And so you're in the right field if you're thinking about innovating within these areas because obviously there's a market. Um, and we think about medical devices as a market. In 2012, the medical device market as a whole was estimated to be around $328 billion. And you know we are recognized to be sort of the ninth largest market in the world. But the important number you want to think about is that 2.1% of global market share. So on average, depending on the site that you read, um, the size of our market, the Canadian market, is between 2 to 3% of the world. So if you put that into context, at the best of times, if you were to develop a product that was diffusing through the entire country, you know, think about the size of the, the market share that you would be uh, possibly working within relative to the US, which is over 50%. So relatively speaking, Canada, as much as it is a fantastic market to think about as your home market, you always wanna think about what it would mean like to do business outside of Canada, because the largest volume of your sales are not going to be coming from this country. An important one to be a part of, but it's not going to be where the bulk of your activity is going to happen. Um, approximately 80% of the medtech market is supplied by imported medical devices. So that's another important thing. Most of the stuff that shows up in our system is actually not Canadian made. So, which is a little unfortunate. Uh, and programs like this really, I think, are trying to turn that a little bit to say, let's internally understand what we're looking for and give, you know, the local innovative uh, innovators and in industry the opportunity to be able to solve for what it is that we're looking to do. Um, the sector is dominated by small and medium-sized enterprises. You would fit right into that um, in terms of numbers. So there's, you know, thousands of small and medium-sized organizations, companies, innovators trying to do this uh, to be able to make a living out of it. Uh, but foreign-owned global companies essentially dominate in terms of market share when it comes to this particular sector. Again, just to understand the lay of the land, uh, there are four large clusters, and the largest clusters in, in the country are Ontario, Quebec, BC, and Alberta. And this is where the bulk of all of the medical device industry resides. If you think about Ontario and Quebec, those two provinces make up about 80% of the entire um, volume of the medical device sector. And so, you know, again, you're innovating in the right province, uh, lots of really great opportunities here. Um, and the benefit you have in Ontario, not just in terms of how fertile it is, is that there are tons and tons of opportunities for support. 
So there's funding opportunities, there's ecosystem building opportunities, there are lots of programs and organizations that are really here to help move the innovation agenda forward. Uh, so really it's a great place to be able to do work within the medtech space. We can get a little bit more now into funding and reimbursement and how things actually happen operationally. So talked about this, 70% of um, the medtech purchases are made at the hospital level. And so hospitals, they receive an annual global budget at the beginning of their fiscal year, generally April 1, and they get this as a lump sum payment from the government based on a series of factors. And so essentially, as they get this volume of money, they've got all their operations to manage. And then in the midst of all of that, you know, they've got innovators knocking at the door saying, I've got the best thing since sliced bread. I'm going to fix, you know, I'm going to revolutionize your hospital, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but if you think about what you're, co you're competing against, which is business as usual, which they have to continue to sort of manage, um, accessing the hospital system is actually a very, very difficult thing. Um, and so the other thing to keep in mind is this, is you've got one single payer providing buckets of dollars to individual institutions, but there is zero oversight or mandate in terms of what they do with those dollars. The decisions of how they spend happens at that gra grassroots at the ground level, uh, which essentially means there's a lot of decentralization of decision-making and that's a very, very important thing, because as you think about solving Sunnybrook's problems, wouldn't it be nice if you could use that same model and sell to the UHNs and the you know, South Lakes and North York Generals and others? Typically, you would have to start to make your own inroads with each of these individual hospitals to be able to get yourself in front of those hospitals for them to have those conversations around around purchasing your technology. So there's a lot of decentralization, lots of fragmentation. Very important for you to keep that in mind as you work through your process. And so outside of hospitals, there are a handful of other pathways for how technologies get adopted. And I won't go into a lot of the details of this because I think you'll get the slides at the end of this, but there are ministry-led programs that offer specific funding opportunities to, to innovators. There are research funds and hospital foundations that offer dollars. Um, there are investigational testing opportunities, and so there's clinical trials that are meant to essentially cover the cost of treatments uh, for technologies that are in the testing phase, but if there aren't any, any options that could work, if there is experimentation that is approved, um, then, you know, between the ITA and the special access program is where you would be able to get funding for those types of, um, for those types of activities. Uh, and so how many of you know what an HTA is? Health technology assessment? Anybody? It's a really important concept to understand. Um, it was sort of, it's been born in the pharmaceutical world, kind of shifted into med tech in the 70s. And essentially what it is, is an objective opportunity for decision makers to look at the evidence that's available for particular technologies and use that for decision making around uptake of those technologies. So the decision to say, should our healthcare system adopt this technology? Should we pay for this technology? Why should we consider this technology versus current standard practice or the competitors out there? It is a, uh, a pretty, I would say, standardized uh, tool that's used around the world to make these decisions. Um, if you don't know about it, just get, get some familiar around, uh, familiarity around it because uh, payers around the world, decision makers around the world are really utilizing this on a more regular basis to make those decisions. Whether it is the end all and be all, I would say it isn't. You know, oftentimes it's looked at as a hurdle, another hurdle yet again to allowing technologies into the market. But certainly if there are opportunities for you to um, get to a place where you're moving either into, and we'll talk about the criteria, but when you've got either high, high levels of tech volumes if you've got a high disruptive capacity to your technology, there's various factors that'll flag you uh, and your technology to be HTA um, assessed. So the landscape of HTA in Canada, much like the reimbursement landscape, is also very heterogeneous. So HTAs happen at the national level, they happen at provincial level, and they also happen at institutional level. So there are some hospitals that have their own embedded HTA units 
that they utilize to say, and one example that I know of that's very, very effective at this is London Health Sciences. Um, they essentially uh, have to have an HGA done on any new technology that wants to be bought within their center. So important for you to know about this. Um, unfortunately, there is no coordination between the HGA bodies. Uh, and we'll, you'll, you'll see that as we talk about the case study a little bit later. Um, the one thing that you want to keep in mind, the province of Quebec is the only province that actually has mandated that hospital-based um, HGA units reside in every university hospital setting. Um, so other provinces that you want to think through, most of them you won't be able to, you won't need to worry about this particular hurdle at the institutional level. And, um, you know, this is really important because for an HDA, the mandate, excuse me, the function of a, an HDA is to provide recommendation to your decision maker around whether or not they should pay for the technology. There is no mandate function to an HDA. So, you know, you go through the, the rigmarole of getting yourself through an HDA, which sometimes takes years. Um, and at the end of the day, you'll get this nice check mark saying, you know, we recommend this technology be taken up by the system. There is no mandate. The payer still doesn't have to. So they're not obliged to the decision on that HDA. Important to keep that in mind. Um, there's a handful of HDA agencies that I've put out here just for your, for your knowledge. And if you want to look those up, important to just understand the lay of the land for that. So we briefly talked about this, the triggers for review of, uh, by the HDA. So why do HDAs come through and what happens in terms of the decision around who should get an HDA? If you've got a disruptive technology, one that's going to be game changing, one that's going to be shifting the way businesses run, practices managed, um, if there is a high potential for a shift in the outcomes that you can achieve using your, uh, your technology, consider disruptive in nature, very likely it's going to be like for an HDA. If you've got a technology that comes with a significant price tag, and if there is a payer, specifically if it's going to be a provincial payer for MRIs, for instance, which is more of a provincial buy, and they know that this is going to cost them millions and millions of dollars, very often that's going to trigger that HDA for them to really make sure they've made the right decision. Um, if you've got a technology that's going to have a significant either budget or population impact, Again, you're going to be likely triggered for that HTA. And oftentimes, the last one here is that potentially there's just a political reason why your technology will be flagged. If there is some sort of a political play, if there's some sort of pressure in some way, way shape, or form, um, you know, that potentially can also trigger an HTA to happen. And so we're going to move on to another concept here called procurement. And you know, I'm not sure if you're aware of the difference between reimbursement and procurement, because there are two very, very different concepts. Um, anyone want to venture and educate a guest on the difference between what reimbursement means and what procurement means? Have we heard of procurement? Yeah? Um, okay. So procurement. If you think about reimbursement, that is the ability for a technology to be paid, right? So when you have reimbursement available for a technology, that basically says that there is a mechanism available for a technology to actually be paid for. Procurement, on the other hand, is the physical act of buying that technology. So you want, you know, the first one essentially says you're opening it up to say you actually are able to sell in the market. And procurement is a physical, okay, here's the mechanism you need to actually go through to to have that purchase made, okay? So that's the differentiating factor there. So companies that are within the medtech space have to go through a very, very intensive procurement process with each individual setting of care before their technology gets implemented into practice. There are very high expectations around trans uh, transparency as well as accountability when you think about procurement. And, you know, another reference for you to look at here is that there is a, an accountability act around the broader public sector directive, which essentially outlines the rules and the um, sort of the, yeah, so the rules that you need to follow as an organization when you're making procurement decisions. 
So the big sort of underlying focus is always open, fair, and transparent. They want to make sure that there is no perceived or literal bias uh, that they demonstrate towards one vendor versus another. Uh, and as a result, it is a, it is a public sort of um, opportunity for them to put it out on the market. They really want to ensure that they can't just make a deal with you as an innovator. How this is going to play out here for your particular uh, program is, on the one hand, Sonny Burke is telling you, here are our problems. You as innovators are saying, well, let's figure out how we're gonna solve these problems. And we're gonna come up with a solution, a service, you know, uh, a combination of the two to be able to solve for that problem. And that's great. And you come up with your technology. Um, and then when it comes to the opportunity downstream, much downstream, for them to buy that technology, they will still need to go through a procurement to be able to pick up your technology. So, as much as you have contextually created something to solve their problem, if they haven't done the right sort of steps up front in terms of making sure they've hit all these procurement milestones, they will most definitely have to still put it out into the public forum, um, identify if there are other technologies, other solutions that are already out there that are similar to your technology. They will invite those technology vendors to also apply for their request for proposals before they go through the mechanism of picking up your technology. So what that tells yourselves as you're thinking through the ideas around what your solutions could, what could look like at this point, and I understand that's kind of where you are, is really understand the competitive landscape. To really start to understand what's out there. If you wanna solve X problem, figure out if there are already things that are out there that are available for that solution to be sorted. Uh, because what it's going to do is alleviate a lot of pain points downstream when you're actually competing now with these other technologies to try to get into the same door, even though you're already here and solving in the direction of the institution that you're at. So very, very important to check the competitive landscape because um, that's going to save you a lot of time downstream. So there's a couple of organizations that you want to keep an eye on, and these are group purchasing organizations and shared service organizations. These are larger organized groups that does strategic buying for a group of hospitals. So there is a lot of consolidation that's been happening over the last few years. Again, oftentimes these are opportunities that hospitals utilize and leverage to say, if they use a, an external source, a group purchasing organization, who represents say 20, 30, 100 hospitals, depending on the size of this organization, and if they're negotiating with vendors like yourselves to say, if we buy 100,000 units, you better drop your price. Um, these are groups of um, organizations that you wanna keep an eye on. They mostly work with commodities. So if you've got a highly innovative technology, they likely don't have the mechanism to buy technologies that are highly innovative. Those would be institution by institution. But if you've got something that can be um, classified as a commodity, for instance, um, that is certainly going to be something that a GPO may have to think through in terms of buying. The hospital is just going to outsource it to their GPO who sorts that out. Um, more and more, GPOs are also getting into the space of innovation. So the one that I know offhand uh, called Plexus is a pretty large GPO, has now hired their own innovation lead that's working very closely to say, okay, well, although innovations in the past didn't come through GPOs, we actually now also want to start doing work within that space. So important to keep that in mind. Now this may be familiar to yourselves, but I thought it'd be important for us to kind of walk through what typical NetTech adoption would look like. So you as industry, when you've got your prototype, when you've got yourselves ready to a place where you want to start to employ it within patients, um, before you can actually move into that realm, you're going to have to cross the bur burden of regulatory approval. So my understanding is you've had a lecture on regula regulatory approval. You know you need to be able to get a license to be able to sell your technology within the market. Uh, and you know, you're going to go through clinical trials essentially to hit the milestones of re relevance to a regulator. And those include 
safety and efficacy for the most part. So are you safe to be administered on patients? Are you, are you efficacious? And do you do what you're intended to do as a technology? And so the, typically the first type of clinical trials that you would be doing in humans would be around generating safety and efficacy data. When you get that data and you go to your regulator, if you've done it right, and if you've really understood what it is that they would be looking for in terms of the class of your technology and the threshold of evidence, you're gonna get an approval. If they reject you, you know, the information goes back to yourselves and you would have to fix that, whether it's more cl clinical trial data, whatever it is that you would require to then cross that bridge for um, that, the hurdle of regulations. And then you're ready to sell, right? You've got your license and you're ready to sell. And you realize that there's this thing called an HDA that you're gonna now have to think about getting through. And sometimes it's three to five years uh, to be able to get through that kind of a, a process. Um, you then have to say, well, maybe you don't have an HD that you need, but you still have to look for somebody who's willing to buy your technology. And so you need to understand what the reimbursement landscape looks like, whether or not your technology is covered or not. And very often innovators don't even think about this until they have that license to sell. They're looking for their buyer and they realize, well, payers are looking for a whole lot of different information than a regulator. They do care for a safety and efficacy of your technology, but more important to them is the cost effectiveness of your technology, the budget impact of your technology on their bottom line. And so they're gonna tell you, well, what's the data on your comparative effectiveness, your cost effectiveness, your budget impact? And that means essentially you're gonna to have to do a whole lot of more evidence generation to be able to give them what it is that they're looking for. And so you've got another hurdle of evidence that you're generating. And so, you know, if everything's great and you get through that, you get your adoption and you're, you know, skipping to the bank. But oftentimes, and more often than not, there is about a 50% rejection rate for Health Canada approved technologies that just don't get paid for by this particular country. It's just that, that that is what it is. So you could be safe and efficacious, but that does not equal the sale, right? So the idea that you guys are doing a needs-driven demand pull technology model really helps to alleviate some of that rejection rate because you're, you're going directly to your payer to say, how can I help you solve your problem? And you're using that information essentially to move through the path towards commercialization. So of course you get rejected and it puts you back to the, to the cycle of saying, now what do I do? So, you know, um, you'll hear this often actually. Um, they, they often refer, refer to that first clinical trial regulator loop as the first valley of death when you're generating evidence towards getting through regulations. And then you've got the second valley of death, which is this other burden of evidence that you're now going to be looking for generating to, to clear reimbursement and, and get that coverage. So we're putting all of this into context. Let's look at a particular case study. So this case study is about a technology called photo selective, selective vaporization of the prostate or PVP. It is a minimally invasive surgical ablation tool that's used to manage something called benign prostate hyperplasia. The indication for this technology, so BPH is a non-cancerous enlargement of the, of the prostate. It is the most common age-related disorder affective, affecting men, and they, it affects actually over 80% of men over 80. So think about those triggers for HTA, right? There's already a handful here. If you think about how medically uh, things are managed for BPH, you've got, a sim like you've got sort of mild to moderate symptoms, you're gonna have lifestyle modifications and pharmaceuticals that are gonna be working with you. But if you've got severe symptoms of BPH, surgery is usually what happens. Now, if you think about what happens in terms of the, the surgical solutions, you've got this transurethral resection of the prostate or TERP, which is the gold standard for this particular uh, type of um, indication. And then you've got this new technology. So the new technology is laser-based, it's got a little bit more operating time initially, but what it does is that it provides the opportunity for a same day outpatient visit for a patient to be able to come in, get the procedure done, and they're out. 
versus a handful of like, you know, between two to three days of a length of stay for, um, for the TERP procedure. You've got shorter catheterization. Again, it's a less invasive type of surgery versus a larger catheterization, which then leads to a higher complication rate for TERP versus PVP. So if you think about, or if you look at what happened to PVP in Canada, it was Health Canada approved in 2003. It took about a year, but they sold their first two technologies in Ontario. And their third technology was sold in 2006, so three years later, in Alberta. Now, it was around that time that OTAC, which is our Ontario Health Technology Assessment Body, flagged it for an HTA because there was this anticipation that there was going to be an increased diffusion of this technology in the province. So you don't need an HTA to, to actually penetrate. But when you're in, this, in, a, in a particular healthcare setting, you can still be flagged for an HTA if they think that you're going to be causing some kind of a burden on, the, on their healthcare spend. 2007, now that the third um, technology or unit is already in Alberta, they realize, wait a minute, there is a much higher opportunity here for diffusion. We also want to do an HTA. So they realize Ontario was doing one, but different provinces aren't obliged to use other material, and so they decided to do their own HTA. This was a relatively quick one. They did their HTA, they found that it was safe, there was less hospitalization, similar follow-up care to TERP, and they generated about a $3 million avoidance of cost over five years when they did their budget impact analysis. Realize 2006, OTAC is still doing it, starting its, its HTA, right? Now this is a field evaluation, so it's real world evidence generation. Alberta looked at existing literature and they did a literature sort of HTA, so a systematic review of what was already out there in the literature, and they came up with their conclusions. 2010, the Urological Association supported PVP, saying, you know what, even though TERP was gold standard, we actually support that PVP is something that should be used in, in practice uh, for the most part. 2011, the first technology unit gets installed in, in Quebec. So 2003, 2011, right? Just keeping it real. Um, and finally, 2014, HQO finally comes out with their response. They support PVP and they say, look, it's got similar benefits to TERP, less cost to the system. In fact, there's an avoidance of about $14 million and 28,000 inpatient days. So that's a substantial savings, right? What do you think happened to this technology in terms of penetration in the market? Do you think they like, did they go anywhere? What do you think? How many people think that it actually, like this is what paved its way to Nirvana? No? Okay. Realists, my goodness. Okay, that's good. Good training. <laughs> okay, so lots of evidence that's supporting PVP as you see. From 2007 to 2011, there's around 20,000 or so TERP procedures. 767 procedures in 2007 to 1,500 in 2011, right? So there's 20,000 versus 1,500, and you've got more and more evidence that says this is the better way to do business, right? Think about the, the distribution of laser procedures. We talked about Ontario and Quebec being the largest markets. Ontario, Quebec, and Alberta, as accumulation, accounted for six to 9% of how many laser procedures were done in our country. It's our largest medical device market. Six to nine percent. So if you think about Canada versus the US, Canada represents, you know, 7.6% of all surgeries are PVP and laser based. In the US, PVP represents over 60% of all BPH procedures. So, you know, you think about it, if evidence doesn't matter, then what does, right? So it's, it's a really, it's a real sobering experience that I think is important for folks like you to know is that the journey to reimbursement and commercialization and all of these things is not an easy one. It's a very rewarding one. And it really, you know, it gets you in the direction of saying you're making an impact to, to humanity, to the health healthcare system, to patients. Um, but it's a, it's a real challenge 
uh, it's a challenge path and you got to have the, the reality check and you got to have the gumption to be able to keep going at it. So, so for now, let's look at PVP versus other jurisdictions. And what I've done is just picked handpicked examples of what happened to PVP in other markets. Uh, and as we're going through it, we're going to talk about some concepts around reimbursement so that you can contextualize it as we go. So the first thing that you want to always keep in mind with reimbursement is setting of care matters, right? So the setting of care that you're going to be putting your technology in, and what I mean by setting of care is whether you're in a hospital versus in a patient's home versus in a resident, a long-term care facility, or in an outpatient setting, right? So those are just different places where you can place your technology. Each of those settings of care is related very specifically to particular codes and particular payment amounts. And, and so, you know, even though you design a technology to be embedded within a particular setting of care, you may have to think about your business model if you go to that particular setting of care and you realize it may or may not work within this particular space that I think I, I would love to be able to put my technology in. And so this example of PVP, if you think about it and just follow the orange um, row here, PVP is an outpatient procedure, right? So within the same day, patients can be discharged to go home. And so the business model that they looked at when they were looking to sell within other parts of the world is that they said, look, everybody wants to shift care from more acute settings to less acute settings. Everybody wants to get patients out of hospitals. This is a revolutionary technology. It's laser based. It gets patients out the same day. Um, we think it belongs in the outpatient setting. So these are like ambulatory care centers where you're just in and out of the hospital at the same time. And what they realized is that the, the setting of care that they had picked oftentimes did not provide them with the right level of reimbursement for them to be able to sell within that particular space. So as they went through different markets, they were selling within the outpatient center uh, centers in the UK. They targeted the inpatient center for France, inpatient for Germany, um, inpatient for Australia. And whoops, what happened there? Thank you. And they actually were able to sell both in the inpatient and outpatient centers within the US. So each time they decided to go into a new market, they really had to sort of understand and pivot depending on the, the landscape of what it is that they were trying to get into. So again, setting up care may vary depending on the reimbursement landscape of the jurisdiction. And then you dig deeper into coding. So there are these things called procedure codes. And it's a type of medical classification that are identifying specific medical or diagnostic interventions, right? So everything, whether you do a procedure, whether a physician sees you or not, each one of those activities is related to a code. And each code then translates into a dollar amount that they would get covered for that cost uh, for that particular activity. So again, if you think about it, you're trying to penetrate a market. You want to sell in a particular setting of care, and that's great. But the next to do that you want to think about then is to say, is there a code that allows this particular technology to be paid for in this particular area, right? Uh, very, very important, again, to, to put that as part of your checklist as well. How does that relate to what you're trying to do now, right? So you guys are in a hospital, you're looking to solve something right within the hospital setting. But if they don't have a code that covers what it is that you're trying to do, then you will need to get a whole lot of activities in place for you to be able to get that code. That activity level can last three to four years just to get a new code. Not an easy thing. So very often strategically, companies will say if there's an existing code that they can utilize, if the reimbursement level is sufficient, oftentimes they'll take it because it's a lot easier than fighting and um, you know, putting all of that effort into trying to find somebody who will support you at many levels from the KOLs to the clinicians to the Ontario Medical Association to the ministry and others 
there is a whole pathway of what you need to do to get a new code. So coding really is an important piece of the journey also. And here's an example, right? So you've got um, this particular technology in the Australian market, and you've got various codes depending on settings of care. So you've got the public inpatient public hospital. That has a particular code and an associated fee. You've got private inpatient public hospital setting that has a particular code and a particular dollar associated with it. So again, as you're trying to figure out, well, where am I selling? You may want to look and saying, well, which of these particular areas would I get the most bang for my buck? And strategically, if you think about you as an innovator, an entrepreneur looking to be able to create a return on investment, to be able to get that sorted through your volume sales, you likely will be targeting where you're going to get paid the most. So if the system, if it's a system lens, they're not going to want you to do that, but you as a smart entrepreneur are clearly going to be looking for where can I get the most money for my technology. And then we've talked about evidence, right? So you're already thinking about evidence generation for your regulatory approval. Um, you know that that talks to the safety efficacy, right? But then there's also things like effectiveness. There's also things like feasibility. There's also things like the social and ethical domains, uh, as well as the economics of your particular technology. So there's lots of opportunity where your stakeholders are going to look for proof that you have what it takes to make that for them to make that decision of whether or not they're going to be covering the cost of your technology. So, you know, we've talked about HDAs. There are various evidence bodies around the world. Um, NICE is a very important one that you want to keep in mind in the UK. Um, lots of jurisdictions ar around the world rely on an HDA done by NICE. Uh, they are globally renowned for the work that they do. Um, ICWIC is the German one, Haas is the French one, and CADETH is our national uh, Canadian um, HDA agency. So keep those in mind, they will be important. But each one of them is going to look at a different threshold of evidence. So what's important to NICE may not be the same thing that's important to another market and another HDA body. And as we look at this particular slide and you look at the threshold of evidence that NICE looked at, they only looked at peer-reviewed randomized control trials as the, the level of evidence that was sufficient for them to say, should we or should we not adopt PVP? Australia didn't even do an HDA. The company just got right into the market and continued to sell. And so again, understanding where you're going and figuring out, well, how much evidence is it going to take for me to convince this particular jurisdiction that I have what it takes? And then there's this thing called innovation funding. So innovation funding essentially is a special pathway that many jurisdictions around the world are more and more creating as opportunities to say, we want to help innovators find an easier path into our market. Um, there's a really great example of a German um, innovation fund. It's a pretty, it's a, it's a great vehicle actually to help move technologies into the hospital setting. And if you're smart and pick a hospital setting that is a calculation hospital, it's what they call them, then as your technology is in there with not the same level of evidence that you would typically require, what they do is they use the opportunity to create real-world cost data for your particular technology to see whether or not it is, in fact, better than incumbents. Um, and then they use that to make decisions around whether or not they want to cover your particular technology in what they know, what they're, they call DRGs, which are their bundle payment vehicles, for how they pay for services um, and for particular indications within their jurisdiction. Uh, innovation funding pathways are unique to each jurisdiction. Not everybody has them. Um, we don't have one, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, I think there is, there's lots of conversation around what we can do locally in Ontario to be able to do something that's similar to what other markets are doing. So really important, not all technologies are eligible for innovation funding and not all innovation funding is ideal for all eligible technologies. So again, important things for you to keep in mind to dig deeper into. Um, so here's the German example. The German example is that they wanted to try really hard to get into the outpatient setting where they thought their technology was ideal for, right? They're shifting everything out of the hospital. 
And they realized that the only way that they were going to be able to sell in the outpatient setting is if they had an HTA done. So the, the arrow on the bottom where it says initial liquid review, that's their HTA activity. And it was as they were getting that HTA activity sorted, um, the, the ministry and the government there essentially said, we're not going to buy in the, in, in the in, I'm sorry, in the outpatient setting unless we understand what the HTA results are. Uh, and so what the company did was it was able to find an innovation path that was allowing them to sell within the hospital setting itself. So again, they had to sort of pivot their market access strategy. Um, they went into that market thinking they were going to do a certain thing. The market gave them the, the signal saying that that wasn't going to happen uh, in the time frame that they had anticipated, which is why they had to sort of think through, well, what else is possible? Um, so, you know, innovation funding pathways certainly can accelerate the path into particular markets. And then the last concept I want to talk about today are physician societies. And these are specialty societies that you want to start to think about also to say, how much influence can you have, can they have on your access into the market? When you've got a strong key opinion leader that's fighting for your cause, um, or if there's a group of physicians, for instance, that are fighting for your cause, this can have a huge impact on what potentially can happen to your technology within markets. Um, so the example I have for you for this particular uh, case for PVP is that there was some sort of pressure in, in around 20, 2011, 2012 from the authorities that essentially was going to be shifting the cost of what they were paying for the standard of care, which was TERP, versus the resection that would be possible through uh, through laser. So it was a 2,000 pound cost that they would be paying for TERP versus 1,000 pounds for, for PVP. So despite the evidence, they actually wanted to shift the cost. So what happens in that regard, right? When a doctor gets paid 2,000 pounds for one procedure and 1,000 pounds for the other, what's the chance they're gonna use what, what's gonna pay them less? Um, but there was a group of, basically it was a physician society that essentially fought really hard um, and was essentially able to shift that so that they were able to get the levels of reimbursement equal for, for both of those technologies, um, which made it then fair for a doctor to say, I will, I'll make the choice if I want to use TERP versus photovaporization of the prostate, but it minimized the influence of funding to be able to uh, to be able to drive um, practice behavior essentially. Yeah. When you use the term reimbursement versus reimbursement, is that the same as referring to reimbursement for a particular technology or reimbursement for the physician for doing a particular operation or whatever they're going? Yeah, so that's a great question. And so coding, depending on the market, there are technical fees that has a particular code. And in the US, there is a technical fee and a physician fee, and the physician fee is what the doc gets paid. In Germany, for instance, if it's a DRG or a bundle payment, then the physician costs are one portion of that total DRG. So very much depends on the market in terms of how you use that word and what it actually means. Okay. Good question though. So here's what happened to photo vaporization of the prostate. You've got five markets. And you had some markets that actually were exceptionally fast at adopting the technology. And in this case, the US was also very high in terms of the level of reimbursement, the, the amount that they paid for for the technology. And then France is on the other side of that screen. France, nine years later, was still doing HTA. And in France, every innovation essentially gets an HTA. And this one, for whatever reason, and it was internal reasons because they, the government is in charge of the activity around HTAs, it, it took that long. And so as this, this company was selling in other parts of the world, it was still spinning its wheels in HTA activity within France. So when you think again, market access pathway, really trying to think about Canadian markets are great and you know, this is what's going to be likely the first market you're thinking, but as you think about what else in terms of the rest of the world, don't always look for the US if, because it's the closest in the English speaking market and the largest in the world, because oftentimes other markets are better. Uh, so be very cautious about the rationale for the why you're picking what it is that you're picking in terms of the market that you're going after. 
Um, the US is not always the fastest to get in. This is another technology called stereotactic radio surgery. The US was actually quite slow in this regard in terms of taking the technology on. It still paid quite a bit. And I think the typical kind of theme you'll see is that the US generally pays quite a bit for technologies in terms of reimbursement. But it's not always the fastest to adopt. Okay? So in summary, because we have flown through this material very, very quickly, and there's a lot of data and, and information that I provided to you this evening, the setting of care matters a lot. You want to really make sure you think about where you're placing your technology and the why behind that. And of course, the setting of care that you pick is very closely related to coding, coverage, and payment that we talked about today. We talked about this, if there's a existing reimbursement codes, find a way to use them as long as that reimbursement level is enough because you wanna make sure that you leverage what's already available. High grade evidence does not always guarantee market adoption. So that gold standard randomized controlled trial isn't always the ticket, right? It just depends again on various markets and what they're particularly looking for. Levers such as adjustment of fee codes, as we saw, when you're changing volume, the, the amount that you're paying based on technologies can often influence um, the adoption one way or the other. Evidence as a whole, you want to look at it market by market because every jurisdiction is going to look at evidence in a very, very different way. And so on the one hand, a strong body of evidence is needed before a widespread adoption can happen. However, there are jurisdictions that have recognized a value in providing that early pathway. So we talked about innovation funding, and so that's a really important one to look at. And of course, the last one that I'm going to talk to you about is physician societies. So really important to say, if you've got key opinion leaders, use them, leverage them as much as you can. But the one sort of final word of caution is just never take anything for granted when it comes to reimbursement. Even when you think all the pieces are aligned, uptake can still be quite challenging. So the idea here is just you've got to plan smart. Um, it's, it's not as obvious as it looks. And as much as you think you've got the best thing since sliced bread, and you're, you and your technology is going to change the course of everything and in medicine the way we know it, um, it might look really sexy, um, but you wanna really vet that idea and you wanna make sure you're getting your market intelligence done, you're getting your competitive advantage or landscape looked at to just keep it real for yourself. And so I'm gonna do like a two minute plug on my program because I think it's important for you guys to know about it. We talked about the process of medtech adoption we remember, we remember we talked about the fact that it's a pretty serial approach. You'll do a bout of um, evidence for your regulator, and then oftentimes you have to do another level of evidence generation for your HCA. Um, this, the problem with this process, and these are pretty obvious things, right? So repeat studies are going to escalate your costs and increase your uncertainty. It's not going to guarantee anything. Um, you're in a very unique situation where your payer is driving your particular business use. Most innovators have no idea what the hospital's looking for. You know, when they're in their research labs, when they're in their own garages, and they're trying to figure out the best, next best thing, they're not really paying attention to does the market care for this or not. And so there's a lot of uncertainty around whether or not your payer is going to prioritize your particular technology. Um, HTA has been accused of policing adoption. It really has become that sort of gatekeeping function that prevents companies from actually being able to get bought in many cases. And the unfortunate thing is because we have a very high threshold of evidence and a, a real uphill battle sometimes when it comes to the adoption of innovation, many innovators are actually just picking up and moving to markets that are faster to get into. So, you know, keep that in mind. Um, as, as things, if you think about all the challenges around that. Um, I'll talk to you quickly about the program that I run because it's quite innovative in what it's trying to do and what they're doing, what we're trying to do through uh, the Excite program, which is run out of Mars, is we're looking at the regulatory activity 
We're looking at reimbursement activity. We're looking at HTA activity. And we're moving all of that into the pre-market space to say, when you're in that early development stage, when it's a lot easier for you guys to, um, to shift, pivot, change, modify, build, not build, all of those things are a lot easier when you've got prototypes as opposed to complete products. Um, this is a type, uh, this is the time when we work with our companies to say, let's build together. It's a collaborative ap approach to say, ourselves as facilitators are working with industry, the Ministry of Health as that single payer person. Um, we have all of the stakeholders that would be required for effective regulatory and reimbursement endpoints of relevance. So the regulators at the table, payers are at the table, the systems at the table, you are the subject matter expert at your technology and you're a key part of that uh, process in the continuum. Uh, and so really we're looking to say, let's try to find a way to streamline the path to market by pooling all of these activities together in that pre-market space when things are a lot easier to manage for yourselves. And we're really looking to shift the paradigm. So we're saying industry is a part of the system and not apart from it. Again, you have a very unique advantage to say you're embedded in the hospital 99% of innovators really are at arm's length from the hospital to say they have no idea what, what's needed on the other side of that wall. Uh, so we're really trying to sort of open those dialogues and collabor uh, collaboratives to be able to help move the conversation in a more cohesive way. Um, we really are trying to get Ontario as the first market for sale so that as you go to the rest of the world, you have your home market as your first customer and that's really, really important. Um, so with that, I'm going to end because I think it is, uh, I am at, at time. And I don't know if there are any particular burning questions you have. I'm happy to answer anything that sort of come forward. Yeah, you've got one in the back. Yes. Sure. Oh, you know, there's, it's very contextual, actually. Um, but, you know, the typical commodities that you would think about, right, the syringes, um, the, the gauze, the gloves, the bedpans, those are typical commodities that you're thinking through. Innovation um, would be the unique, disruptive, breakthrough, it's not fitting the mold. Um, so, you know, again, there's, there's a bit of a nuance. Um, but the obvious ones are the ones that you would think if I had to, you know, the toilet paper, like those are all commodity things that GPOs and SSOs would be responsible for in terms of volume. But you're not going to be putting an MRI through a GPO because there isn't going to be a lot of volume of that. Um, so think about it in terms of volume of sales because that's one easier way to manage that. Yeah, again, that's a commodity. Yeah. Yep. Well, okay, so if you're doing an incremental shift in an ET2, right? That's a 510K for US purposes. Um, but the case to be made about why a buyer should think about why do I need an incremental improvement in your in this particular technology, right? If it's a me too, if you're just shifting something different or unique and making it a different product. That does you know 10 other things that's that's a different case but if you're just an incremental then you've got the competitor that's already in selling and you've got this new technology that's a small startup you're competing against this commoditized object you're going to have a really hard time penetrating that market so you know that's something to keep in mind in terms of does it make sense to innovate as an incremental when you're a small enterprise So when you're selling through a GPO, you're going to be on a contract for sometimes five to seven years where you've signed up with this GPO. You're getting a massive volume discount if they're selling, you know, if they're able to buy X hundred thousand units for the next five or seven years. Now you, as somebody that's coming into that market, are going to have a really hard time penetrating that. So one, you're not going to be able to sell into that market until those contracts are up. And when those contracts come up for renewal, you know, typical product life cycle for a medical device is about 24 months, so 12 to 24 months. So companies that are, that are in the space are iterating also. They're going to come up with their next generation product. 
And so you've got your tech competing against what's already in the market, but that's already going to have its own iteration and, um, and shift in terms of what it's able to do. So it's a, it's a pretty hard market to penetrate. How likely are other provinces to follow OTAC decisions? Oh, um, yeah. Uh, and for those that were uh, that are listening to this webinar, I uh, I, I basically said zero. Um, where oftentimes, more often than not, each province is going to want to do its own evidence generation. It's very unfortunate. There is not a lot of synergies between HGA bodies around the country, let alone the world. Um, there are some like NICE where their, their evidence standards are relatively high and very established. So many markets around the world are going to look at NICE and say, if NICE approved it, we're going to at least look at this with more favorable lens, but they may still choose that they want to do their own contextual evidence generation. And it's all about context. So you know, it's not a bad thing that Alberta wants to do their own Alberta HTA. Uh, it's wasteful. It, it can be looked at as inefficient. But what Alberta is saying is our demographic is very different from Ontario. And we want to make sure that we're looking at it from the lens of who's going to use it in our system. Our costing is going to be different. Um, you know, the way we roll out the technology, the way we're managing our care, the way we manage our payments and our funding. Uh, they have rationale as a different province to feel like they want to do their own. Uh, and every province actually has that, that privilege. So what happens, unfortunately, then, is a lot of repetition when it comes to HTA evidence generation, where you'll see, you know, Cadiz will do a national one. But if it comes to Ontario, Ontario will want to do one through OTAC. And if it happens to go to London Health Sciences, they'll say, the only way we let you in is if we do our own OTAC review or our own um, HTA review. So, you know, one technology's got three different HDAs going, and that's not abnormal. Sure. Yeah, so the question was, is there a difference between decision-making for private versus public? Most of the conversation we've had today is around the public payer because that's the largest share of the, uh, the funding that happens within our province. The case to be made for private insurance is very, very different. Um, they're not looking at HTAs for the most part. Uh, they really are, for the most part, looking for cost savings. Um, and so if you've got a competitive advantage, if you're the type of technology that a private insurance cares for, um, and there's just, you know, there's a list they have of the things that they will cover versus not, and if you're not one of those things on the list, it's really hard to get on their list, but it's possible. Um, but it's a different level of activity and a different strategy altogether. Yep. Yeah. Um, every insurance has their own activity related to coverage decisions versus not. Um, if you're able to penetrate one, it might be looked at as an advantage when you go to another to say, well, Sun Life is paying, Manual Life, can you look at this closely? Or Great West Life, you know, can you look at this closely? Um, they might actually feel more secure if they realize one's already covering it. So it, it might be hard to get that first signature, but then it might be easier after. But it's not that they would look at Great West Life and say, oh, they've covered it, so we better cover Anybody else? Okay, well, that's great. It's been lovely chatting with yourselves and all the best, right? So, you know, this is not doom and gloom. I know there was a lot of negativity we talked about in terms of how challenging it is, but it's not really for you to feel depressed about it. It's just for you to sort of look at it and say, you know, the, the path to reimbursement and the path to commercialization is not an easy one, right? So stay motivated, figure out, what drives you in terms of what it is that makes you get up and want to do this every day and then use that energy to keep going um, because it's a great cause that you're after. Uh, just be smart about how you do it. So all the best.